What do I think of when I think of the word timeless? Uh, myself, honestly. Mr. Scott, this video is about engaged church. I, 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 when I think of the word timeless, I'm reminded of engaged church. Is that better? I envision a place, a place that is founded upon the mandate to engage God, people, and culture. A place that operates by the conviction of its values. Authenticity. Diversity. Spiritual family. Development. And innovators reconciliation. Values are important. We need to model them. We need to embody them. This generation and the next need to know what development looks like. They need to be bold, to be empowered. Because when you shine, we shine. You know, I look at this world we're living in. It can get a little crazy out there with lots of division and chaos. With all that is no match for family. God saved me, but spiritual family made me. As long as we have family, we have everything. We all we got. I believe that it is not our diversity that divides us. If it's in our hands to make a better world for this generation and the next, then we must be willing to make room, to hold the gospel tightly and everything else loosely. This done well could be the very thing that demonstrates to the world that we are a people known for how we love, a people known for how we make room for those who are different than us. Authenticity is absolutely the most important thing you can do with your life. You have to dare to be aware. I practice this all the time. When I first started this, I knew exactly what to do, but in a much more real sense, I had no idea what to do. And just like me, you'll get there too. I have a dream that one day we will build bridges and not walls that we would change the narrative on reconciliation with our commitment to develop and launch innovative reconcilers into the world. I envision a place that will continue to engage God, people, and even the fringes of culture as these values are held tightly, because these values are timeless. Engage church, I believe you are. This place I envision. Power is meant to be given away. When an individual is given power, it is, it is expected that they will use it to empower others around them. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for our little uh, intermission right there. Uh, my name is Cody. I serve as the staff architect here. I am not an architect uh, by any means. I uh, more so am kind of a run the operations of the church and potentially uh, every once in a while, Pastor Adrian, for whatever reason, asked me to preach. So I appreciate you, big dog. Um, <laughs> Today is a very special day. It is National Pastor Appreciation Day. It is National Pastor Appreciation Day. So before I get into my sermon, I want to take time to honor three men um, that have really given their lives to this mission um, and to really launch Innovative Reconcilers. So Pastor Adrian, our leading and founding pastor, um, has given everything he's got for 10 years at this thing. Pastor Derek, uh, he leads our Nehemiah Institute, and he's actually helping uh, launch our first church plant in the new year in Appalach. Uh, and then finally, Pastor Jamie, he's been on staff uh, with us before, has elder oversight, spiritual oversight. So if we can, if we can just stand and honor them, um, I'd love to just clap it up. Yeah. Legends. Legends. All right, y'all sit down. Next 30 minutes is about me. <laughs> Next 30 minutes is about me. No, we love you guys. We're so grateful for you. Um, our starting scripture today is going to be in the book of Matthew, Matthew 26, verse 31 to 36. I'll say it before, I've said it again. I'll say, um, again, I'll said it before. I'll say it again. And if you bring your Bible, I think Jesus loves you a little bit more. Verse 31, on the way, Jesus told them tonight, all of you will desert me for the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter declared, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. 
Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. Now, I don't know what it is about being on stage, but I'm gonna tell you all the truth. I feel more comfortable admitting my shortcomings and faults on stage, right? Than if we were like a one-to-one individual conversation, right? Because I don't really got to look you in the eye on stage. I kind of look like right over your head, all right? And so for whatever reason, I feel more comfortable admitting my shortcomings and faults. And I'm about to admit admit one to y'all, but let me give you a little context first. I am 27 years old, right? I've been working in corporate America for about five years. I have a wife, I have a mortgage, I have a dog. There's levels of responsibility that I have in my life that I actually do decent, I would say. So this next fact might shock you. I have run out of gas as a 27 year old man four times in the last calendar year, (laughs) four times, what? I know some of you are like worried about me. Like, dude, are you okay? Like I had money in the bank account. I had time to go get gas. I don't know what it was, but I ran out of gas four separate times. Let me prove it to you, right? One was off Appalachian Parkway. It was in my old job. I was wearing a full suit, dead summer. It was July, right? And so I'm getting there and I, I see the gas tank on E, but I'm like, it's, it's fine. We'll make it, we'll make it to work. And yeah, big faith, there you go. Make it to work. But all the lights start to flicker on the dashboard and you know that's a bad sign, right? So I I, I pull off on the side of Appalachia and I have to walk an entire mile to go get gas in the middle of July in a suit. It was horrible, drenched in sweat. So I go get the little gas canister, I put it in. And you would think that, man, that's bad enough. Like I would never probably run out of gas again. But I proceeded to run out of gas three more times in the next calendar year. One of them, I gotta tell you just a little bit more context. One of them was off Miccosukee and it was during five o'clock traffic. And I, I, I promise you, I ran out of gas in the middle of an intersection. And so like, I pull like the the classic, like security cop, like I'm like directing traffic, like you go that way, you go this way, you go that way. And some guy was so nice. He got out of his car. He's like, Hey man, your battery died. You good? You need me to jump it? And I wanted to lie so bad in that moment. Yeah, dude, my battery just went out. Right. But I didn't, I told the truth and said that not man, I ran out of gas and he just shook his head. Like, dude, you're an idiot. (laughs) You're an idiot. Last one. I'm almost done. Uh, This week literally happened to me three days ago. I ran out of gas on the way back from coming back from Greenville, Florida on I-10. On I-10, right? I know, I heard someone say Cody, like, oh, bless his heart, right? That's what we say here in the South. (laughs) And so I do what any good man would do. I call my wife. (laughs) Okay, babe, I need you to come bring me some gas. But then I pull idiot move number two. And guess what I forget to do? Turn the lights off. Turn the lights off in my car. So not only am I out of gas on I-10, but my lights are out now too and my battery is shot. So then my wife and I proceed to jump my car on the side of I-10 because I just didn't get gas. And then I forgot to turn my battery off. In some ways I'm like, I'm a fool y'all. And I'm okay to admit it here on stage, right? Now, why do I, why do I tell this story? Why do I talk about this? I was curious of why I actually ran out of gas four times. Like, why did I actually allow myself to do that? And in every instance, Every time I had this underwhelming sentiment inside of me saying, oh, I got this. I got this. I'm not worried about it. I'll get to the next gas station. I'll get it later, right? I've got this, no worries. I've got this. What is Peter underlying sentiment of what he's saying to Jesus in Matthew 26? I got this. I got this. Have you ever had a moment in your life in which you've said, oh, I've got this. I don't need God. I don't need help from other people. I've got this. How to work out. How did it work out? You see, we're in a series now called Timeless and we're talking through our values here at Engage Church because we believe our values are timeless. They can be applied to any generation or any groups of people that call themselves followers of Jesus. And today I've been tasked with talking about one that is probably one of my favorites, it's development. It's development. And today I wanna tackle three main questions on the idea of development. One is what is it that Jesus wants to develop inside of you? Or what does Jesus want to develop? Two, what does the journey of development really look like as Christians? And then three, how do we walk well in the journey of development? Would y'all pray with me? God, we thank you for today. I thank you that even though I'm an idiot, you still love me. God, would you really help me not run out of gas again? And would you help the Seminoles who are five and zero continue in their great journey of development? 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's it. Mic drop. It's over. <laughs> it's over. All right. So first question, what is it that Jesus wants to develop in us? Or what does he actually want to develop? See, I think if we want to find the answer to that, we have to go back to the book of Genesis. See, in Genesis chapter one, God created everything. He created the birds and the bees and, and the animals and humans, and he created everything and everything he said was good. It was good. But God did not create us as though we were to be robots, that we would just worship him no matter what. He actually created us with a choice. So what he does is he puts the tree of knowledge of, of good and evil inside the midst of the garden where Adam and Eve were. And what do our first parents do? They fumble the bag, right? They go and grab the fruit, take of it, and they disobey the commands of God. And now we think, man, it's just a little mess up. It's just something small. But at this moment, things would change drastically for humanity right? You and I were actually designed to be in a loving, trusting relationship with God. We were designed to be what I would call the authentic self. And the authentic self, y'all, is awesome. Like the authentic self, you, 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 deep down, you have different gifts, unique callings that God wants to do with your life. The authentic self is great. But a prerequisite of that is to be in a loving, trusting relationship with God. And so what did Adam and Eve do in that moment? We have a chart up here actually talking about it. I feel like I'm on my teacher grind right now, right? But that's the authentic self in the middle. The one who's supposed to be in a loving, trusting relationship with God. But Adam and Eve, they choose self-sufficiency. They say, God, I, I, we don't want to follow your way. We're actually going to follow our own way. And there's some byproducts of that. Human beings get a lot more complex in that moment. Y'all seen the movie Shrek, right? Like ogres have layers. Ogres are like onions. Human beings in that moment got much more <laughs> complex. I've got to ignore Pastor Adrian, he's making me laugh. And fear and shame enter into the world at those moments. And as Dr. Zoda would say, fear and shame are the enemies of our soul. They're the enemies of our soul. So instead of shame is this idea that, man, I've made a mistake. A failure has happened. I've fallen short in this way. But instead of saying that shame says, oh, I'm the mistake. I'm the failure. I'm the reason. I'm the main thing that caused this to happen. And shame, because of that, what our first parents decided to do is they decided to double down on self-sufficiency. Like in that moment, they could have gone to God and responded and said, God, would you take us back? Would you help us? We made a mistake. But what they did is they chose self-sufficiency again. And we see that they sewed fig leaves together, right? And that's what they then presented to God. And that's when I believe the false self was formed. See, the false self is the identity that we want to bring to the world. It's the thing that we want to show to the world. So we're actually afraid of what's going on in the inside. We're afraid of the uh, inconsistencies within our life. So what we do is we portray this false self. We portray this false self. For Adam and Eve, it was the fig leaves. What is it for you? What is the false self for you? See, the first, the thing that Jesus actually wants to develop in us is the authentic self. It is the authentic self. But in order for that to happen, you and I have to say yes to a journey of development. We have to say yes to that journey and that journey is hard. Now we fast forward a few thousand years and I think one of the greatest examples of development in scripture is the apostle Peter, right? Is the apostle Peter. So we fast forward a few thousand years and we get to the life of Peter. And the thing that we need to know about Peter, a couple things off rip is that he is a Jew, right? He is a Jew. So at the time he would have studied the scriptures. He would have studied the Old Testament. He would have known that there was to be a Messiah, a savior that was gonna come and set his people free. He lived with that hope and that expectation. But also Peter lived in a very weird time in history. Scholars say that the Old Testament, when it ended in the book of Malachi to when Jesus came on the scene, it was a 400 year dead zone. Nobody heard anything from God. What do you think Peter lived in? Peter lived with a sense of hopelessness, hopelessness. I've heard about this savior. I've heard about this Messiah. I've heard about this person that's supposed to come and set the captives free, but my reality doesn't look anything like it. My reality doesn't look anything like it. So what does he do? Well, he does what any of us would do. He busies himself in the thing that gives him value and significance. So that's why Peter, before he's Peter, he's named Simon and he's often referred to as Simon the fisherman go back to our diagram earlier. What's his false self? It's the fisherman. That's where he, that's where he gets value from. That's where he gets worth. That's where he gets significance, right? 
But then Jesus comes on the scene and interacts with Peter three times before he would really go and follow him with everything that he had. The first one we see in John chapter one, he goes up to Peter, who's Simon at the time. He goes, yo, Simon, son of John, you will now be called Cephas, which means Peter. Jesus pulls kind of this weird move, y'all, where he gives him a nickname off rip. Like the first time he ever meets him. I don't know about y'all, but like nicknames are like, you kind of got to earn a nickname, right? The only one that can give me a nickname off rip is the twins, Oscar and Marvin. Like y'all called me, dude, I, they, they called me code breaker one time. I was like, dude, that's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Shout out to my guys chopping trees up here. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Anyway, but Jesus gives a nickname right there in that moment. And that's important. We'll put a pin in it and come back to it. Second time we see that Jesus approaches Simon again when he's fishing. He says, come and follow me. I'll make you a fisher of men. And Peter actually responds to the call. But scholars would say that that response only lasted about four months. And then what do you think Peter went back and did? Fish. To where he felt safe. To where he felt his identity was. That's where he felt comfortable. Jesus, for a third time, approaches Peter. And we pick it up in the book of Luke. It says this in Luke 5. Now, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I am such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. See, it took three times for it to actually get through uh, Simon's or Peter's thick skull that he needed to follow Jesus. He needed to go and follow him. And chapter one of Peter's story is what I would call uh, the chapter of hope. The chapter of hope. See, Peter, like most of us in here, we, he lived in this place of hopelessness. He lived in a place in which things were overpromised and underdelivered. Does that sound familiar in our society today and what we operate in? Oh, if you just focus on your mental and emotional health, you'll get right. You can be the authentic self. If you can just say, if you can identify an emotion on the emotion wheel, man, that you're headed in the right direction, things are going great for you, right? Or maybe if you exercise three or four times a week, life will just go right for you. And I'm not saying those are bad things, but we are, we are fed lies that overpromise and underdeliver. We're fed them. Just like Pastor Adrian talked about weeks, weeks ago, we have access points that are everywhere trying to get into our life and feed us the lie that they can be the hope that bring us to the authentic self. But they're not. How is it working out for you? See, human beings were designed to hope in something. We were designed to hope in something. And the only thing that can really carry that weight is the person of Jesus. So what does Jesus do in the interactions? He actually identifies the false self. He says, you're no longer going to be called Simon. You will be called Peter. Jesus in this moment gives him a sneak peek of what the authentic self looks like. What does that do in Peter? That inspires this hope, this hope that maybe if I do follow Jesus, he can take me to the place where I've always wanted to be. And I'm not talking about in terms of riches or wealth or, or anything like that. I'm talking about like when you, when you sit up at night and you think about how you want to be a better father, when you think about how you want to be a better Jesus follower, when you think about how you want to be a better friend, those type of things. And Jesus says, I can actually get you there. What have you put your hope in that's not of Jesus? See, the, I love the response of Peter in Luke 5. It says that he dropped his nets. Where did Peter get his value, his significance, his worth from? In fishing. What did Peter have to do to transfer his value, significance to the identity that Jesus had for him? He had to drop his nets. What are the nets that you're hoping in and that you think will get you to the place of the authentic self? Because I promise you, only Jesus can get you there. Only Jesus can get you there. So Peter responds to the call in that moment. He believes in the hope of Jesus and starts to follow him for the rest of his days. Chapter two, I would title productivity or production. 
Peter starts to kill it, man. He's following Jesus and things are just up and to the right. Things start to go well. He starts with the feeding of the 5,000, right? He's, he's part of Jesus' inner circle, his crew, his posse. Things are up and to the right for Peter. Have y'all ever been in seasons like that where you just feel like things are rolling with you and God? Like every, like I used to do the thing where I like open up my Bible and I'd be like, God, I know you're gonna speak to me here in this moment. I would point to a verse and be like, uh, Leviticus 27, 32 talks about um, the tabernacle. And I must, I don't know. I, I just like thought it was written directly to me and I took it completely out of context, right? But the productivity stage with God is sweet. And I would encourage you to run fast in those seasons. Like be used by God. He wants to use you. He really does. But I would also heed um, a warning of caution that Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, verse 17 to 20, it says this. When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Yes, he told them. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over all power of the enemy and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. But don't rejoice because evil spirits obey. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. Be careful in the stage of productivity because what you can start to do is you can double down on self-sufficiency. You can think that, oh, Jesus is this great add-on in my life. He makes me more clever. He makes me more wise. He makes me more fun. I love Jesus. He's this great little buddy that I have on the side of my motorcycle as we're going through the, the, the ways of life. But Jesus says, no, I'm your Lord. I am your Lord. I gave you the productivity. I gave you the production. Do not rejoice in those things, but rejoice that your name, what is he saying? Rejoice that your identity has been changed in me. You're no longer having to operate in the false self. You can grow in the authentic self because Jesus has changed you. I wish we could stay in the productivity stage forever, right? When I first got there, when I was a young Christian, I was like, dude, the life of Jesus is cake. This is awesome. I get to freaking preach and do all this stuff and it's great. But as Tyler Stanton would say that we don't leave this, the stage of productivity by choice. We leave it by crisis. Crisis happens. Chapter three in the journey of development, exposure and pain. Exposure and pain. See, so yeah, at this moment in the story of Peter, everything is up and to the right. But then something unique happens in Matthew chapter 16. Something very unique happens. Jesus starts to talk openly about the fact that he has to go to the cross. And Jesus, remember, he's fully God he's, and he's fully man. So he's wrestling with this idea that he has to go and do this. So Jesus talks to his disciples about it openly and he's wrestling with it. And this is how Peter responds to Jesus's wrestling. This is just wild, y'all. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him. Y'all know who he's talking to, right? He's talking to God. He began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Verse 23, Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my father, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. See, I think, but if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. See, I think this was a marking moment in the life of Peter. I think it was an actual an invitation from Jesus to say, how do you wanna go about the pain and exposure that I'm about to, to put you through? How do you wanna go through this process in the journey of development, right? I think there's two main routes that you and I can take. And this is a necessary part in the journey of development. Because if we're being honest in here, y'all, if we look at our hearts and our souls and the things that are inside of us, there's some nasty stuff going on, man. There's some ugly parts of us as humans. And I know we don't like to admit it, but Jesus loves us too much to keep us there. He loves us too much to keep us there. He's like the great surgeon or the great doctor that looks at the infirmities within our soul and says, I can make you well, but I have to take you on this journey. And I think we have choices in the journey of how we can go about it, right? Like what if Peter's response in that moment was that he was just curious? Like he was curious, like, yo, Jesus, you just called me Satan. Let me be curious and close to you and figure out what that means, right? What if he had chosen that route? He said, hey man, I don't, I don't understand what you're saying, but I trust you, I love you, you're my Lord. And when you say tough things to me, I'm gonna respond. But scripture doesn't indicate that that happened. 
what did Peter do in that moment? He doubled down on self-sufficiency. He doubled down again on self-sufficiency. The question I want to ask you, and I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but your journey of development with Jesus, pain and exposure are necessary parts to go through. But what route will you choose? Will you be close and intimate and curious with Jesus when he, when he comes and he reprimands you and he corrects you in a kind, loving way? Or will you choose the route that Peter took of self-sufficiency? We fast forward a few chapters later and we see what we read in the beginning, Matthew chapter 26, Peter's famous, I've got this statement, right? He says to Jesus, I will never deny you. I will never desert you. He says, I've got this. But moments later, we see in Matthew chapter 26, um, we see him actually go and deny Jesus three times. We want to pull it up. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A serving girl came over and said to him, you were one of those with Jesus, the Galilean. But Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Later out by the gate, another serving girl noticed him and said to those standing around, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it, this time with an oath. I don't even know the man, he said. A little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. We can tell by your accent. Peter swore a curse on them. If I'm lying, I don't know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. Suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. And he went away weeping bitterly. Peter chose the route in which his pain, in which his, the things in which he struggled with, the false self had to come out in the open, had to come out in the open. And I love, uh, there's actually a account in Luke chapter 22, verse 61. that says this, I'll read it real quick. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. This is right after Peter denies Jesus three times. Like think about the worst failure in your life. Think about the time in which you screwed up and you, you never thought that you would be able to recover from it. Think about the thing that you've done that said, man, how could I ever have let that happen? This is what the apostle Peter is feeling in this moment. And then him and Jesus lock eyes. Wow. They lock eyes. One of the most important questions you can ask yourself in the journey of development, you have to, you have to answer it for yourself, is what did Jesus' eyes look like in that moment? What did they look like? Was Jesus pissed? Was he angry? Was he upset? Did he look away? How could you ever do that to me? How could you ever abandon me after all that I've done for you? Or was Jesus just this, oh, it's fine. Don't worry about it. I know you messed up a little bit, but it's all good. No. You have to answer that question. What did Jesus's eyes look like? Because that's going to dictate how you continue on in the journey of development. That will dictate it. There's a tension to be managed there with Jesus. Jesus's eyes, the Bible says, are like fire. What does fire do to us? It exposes things. It burns things up so that new things can come up. So Jesus in that moment, I believe his eyes were like fire and that they exposed Peter in the false self. But in the same breath, Jesus's eyes are full of love. They're full of compassion. They're full of saying, you're not the, the sum of your worst failures. You're not the mistakes that you've made. You're actually a, still a son. Your identity is still in me. And so even though you've fallen short and you've failed in a way that you never thought that you would, I still love you and I'm still for you. And I still want to take you on this journey of development. I can tell you that all day, but what do the eyes of Jesus look like when you fail? You have to answer that question. You and you alone. In order for us to go on the journey of development towards the authentic self, we must expose the part of ourselves that are self-sufficient and ugly, or they will be exposed for us. Hmm. We see here that moments later, Jesus would go to the cross and he would die for our sins. He would die for our sins. But thank God that that's not the end of the story. Jesus rises again three days later, later defeating death, defeating our own failures, defeating our own sin. And what we think would maybe be the end of Peter's story is actually just the beginning. Chapter four, restoration, restoration. Jesus appears to Peter in John 21. And what do you think Peter went back to do after Jesus died? Fish, that's where he felt safe. 
It's where he felt secure. It's where he felt value. So Jesus comes up on the shore and he recreates the story back in Luke chapter five. He says, hey man, cast your net this way. At that moment, loads of fish come into the boat and Peter wakes up to who it is. He sees that it's actually Jesus. Peter hops out the boat, swims on shore. I don't even know if my guy could swim that well, but he's like, I gotta get to Jesus. I gotta get to Jesus. And what does Jesus do in that moment? He sits there and has breakfast with him and sits with him and talks with him and loves him and reminds him that you're not the sum of your worst failures. You're actually a son of mine. We pick it up in John 14. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he'd been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. Peter replied, you know, I love you. Then feed my lambs. Jesus told him, Jesus told him, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Peter said, you know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep. Jesus said a third time, he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you to where you don't want to go. We thought that chapter three, the exposure and pain was the end of the story, but Jesus says, I have a better plan and I'm willing to restore you, man. I'm willing to restore you. But what Jesus had to do in that moment was that he had to remind Peter that his identity is not locked up in the false self, but it's actually in the authentic self. It's in the person that he was designed to be. Jesus restores him in this moment. And this is important because some of you in this room, you've run from Jesus because of the pain and exposure he's put you through. You've experienced real pain and exposure of what's going on in here. And maybe it wasn't even your fault. Maybe it was something that happened to you, but Jesus is saying, I love you too much to keep you there. And why does he say, why does he ask Peter, Simon, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And then his response is to go and feed my sheep because we got a place to go, y'all. The journey of development is not about you. In a sense it is, but it's also about your purpose so that you can go and love people and you can go and bring them into the kingdom. Simon, do you love me? See the purpose of development and the reason why Jesus brings us through it is because he wants to beat the self-sufficiency out of you. He wants to beat the self-sufficiency out of you. You were designed to be in perfect relationship with him and to trust him. Will you allow that to happen? See, the, the truth of the matter, like I've said before, is that pain and exposure are necessary parts in the journey of development. But Jesus can restore us no matter what we've done. No matter what we've done. Now, if I were to think about this journey of development, I think that developers do three main things while they're on this journey. Developers learn intimacy, developers learn contentment, and developers learn to respond. The first one is that if you wanna be developed by Jesus, you have to learn what it means to be intimate with him. Peter walked with Jesus for over a thousand days. Imagine walking with somebody for a thousand days. You'd get to know everything about that person. What is your time with Jesus like? What is it like? Do you leave time for him throughout your day? Because if you don't set it, man, it's not gonna happen. We're all busy. Life is crazy, but this intimacy with Jesus is incredibly important because what does intimacy do? Intimacy brings trust. Intimacy brings trust. So when Jesus pokes and prods at the ugly parts of you, our first reaction might be, ooh, I gotta step away. I don't like this. But when you're intimate with Jesus, you say, yes. I receive this pain. I'll take this pain because I know where you're going to take me. And I know that you're gonna make me well. What does your intimacy with Jesus look like? The second thing that developers do is they learn contentment. Peter gets a bad rap y'all, but he has some awesome moments too. John chapter six, we see that so many, uh, Jesus says some hard teachings and so many people leave him at that moment. Jesus looks to his disciples and says, hey, are y'all gonna go too? And Peter says, where would we go? Where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. In that moment, Peter is practicing contentment. 
I'm not going to go to other sources of hope. I'm not going to go to other access points. I'm not going to go to other things that give me worth and significance. I will stay right here despite the pain that I'm going through, despite the pain of the process of development. Do you practice contentment? Paul says that he's learned in all things to practice it, whether high, whether low, whether with plenty or whether with none. You can have contentment despite your life circumstances. And finally, developers learn to respond. They learn to respond. And I think this part is so important because we have to have an adequate and a real scoreboard of what our life with Jesus looks like. What I mean by that is like, we actually have to have a realistic picture of what following Jesus looks like. I know for, for me, sometimes I can be like, oh, Jesus, I'm just going to go through a, you know, a tough three months. I'm going to get therapy. I'm going to get in the word. I'm going to be prayed up. And you're just going to make me like him after that, right? Like I'm going to have no problems and no issues. But I have to look at my scoreboard. I have to look at my scoreboard. My scoreboard can't be this future version of myself that I put my hope in. My scoreboard has to be, man, I just want to get a little bit more like him every day. I just want to get a little bit more patient. I want to get a little bit more loving. I want to be a little more kind, a little more, more like my savior and Lord Jesus. What is your scoreboard? That's important because we'll respond based on our scoreboard. If you think, man, that I just need to be this perfect follower of Jesus, when you fail, you won't run back to him. But if your scoreboard is managed, you need to get a little bit better. You'll respond when life's failures hit. Peter's uh, story, I wish you could say that after this moment with Jesus in John 21, everything was up and to the right again. Everything was good. Nope. (laughs) My guy had some great moments after that, but he also had some moments in which people had to come in and correct him like the apostle Paul corrects him after he's not preaching. Uh, He's actually discriminating against people within the church and Paul has to come in and step in. He fails again. But what does Peter do? He accepts it and responds. And then at the end of his life, Stories would tell us that, or history would tell us that Peter is in Rome in AD 67 and he's about to be crucified by Nero, who's the Caesar at the time. And the disciples, good friends of Peter say, hey man, you got to run away. Run away, seek um, safety and get out of here. So Peter takes the advice of the disciples and he starts to walk away from the city. And the story has it that Jesus appeared to him, just appears to him. And and Peter in that moment knew his lot in life. He knew that it was actually him supposed to turn around and to be crucified. So what does he do? He turns around and says, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my savior was. Crucify me upside down. I can't promise you your journey of development is gonna end the way you want it. I can't promise you it's going to end in this way that's awesome and that everybody's going to cheer you on and things are going to go great and you're just going to die in your sleep at 97. But what I can promise you is that it's worth it. I can promise you it's worth it. Would we be a people that put our hope in the, in the Savior, in King Jesus, that takes us from a place of inadequacy, that takes us from a place of the false self and brings us to the place of the authentic self? I pray that we would. Uh, Preaching sermons, y'all, it's it's difficult. (laughs) And preparing for it is stressful. It takes a lot of work and a lot of time. And I'm really proud of the system we have here at Engage um, because we take it very seriously. Got to have our sermon done almost two weeks in advance. Got to preach it to somebody three times before you get up on stage here and do it, right? Pastor Adrian, man, he's, he's, he's serious with that system, right? And I went to him one time, I go, hey man, why do we do this? And he said, I want the best version of you up there on Sunday. Why does Jesus put us through the journey of development? Maybe one day he wants us to stand before him as the best version of who we really are. The authentic self, the authentic self. Would you guys pray with me? Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for this morning. We thank you that you want to develop us, that you love us so much that you do not want us to stay the same way. At this moment, I just want to pray for two groups of people, if I can. One, that if you've never put your hope in Jesus, 
if you've never if you you've never really dropped your nets and said that I will not put my hope in things of this world, but I want to put my hope in the person of Jesus. Would you raise your hand? I just want to pray for you that you would put your hope in him. The second group of people I want to pray for is those that have experienced exposure and pain. And maybe in the exposure and pain, you've run from God. You've run from him. And today you want to be restored and come back into relationship with him. Would you raise your hand? I just want to pray for you. I see your hands. I see your hands. You want to be restored by Jesus. And he's saying, I'm here. Let me do it. Father, I pray for everybody's hand that is raised. God, that you would honor and meet them here in this moment. Father, that your spirit would come and you would heal wounds, you would heal infirmities, you would heal things inside of them. God, parts of their soul that are ugly that need to be exposed to you and they could walk in real relationship with you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give God a hand clap of praise for what he did? Thank you so much, Cody. Before we get into worship, I simply just want to say this, why this is such a value of this church and why we should walk in this idea of development is because we're living in a society in the world right now where what a lot of people say, there's really no substance to it. And what the world hungers for, what people are hungering for is people who actually have something to say because they've been through stuff. There's something different when someone who talks about an idea versus someone who's lived an idea. And what God wants to do and what he is doing, I believe, in the earth is he's looking for men and women who are willing to allow his spirit to develop them so that then he can send them to wherever he's called them to go to do the same for others. And it's not an easy process. But my encouragement is that we live this value. Remember, we are the church. You as individuals are the church. This church here doesn't have this value if the people don't live this value. It's just words on a wall or words on a website. It's not actually something that we embody. So my encouragement to you as your pastor is this. Some of you, you're in that season right now where you're in the pressing fire. And my encouragement by the Spirit of God is don't quit. That's it. Do not quit. That you would suffer well that you would stay the course, you would stay on the potter's wheel and let God do his thing. For some of you, things are up and to the right. You have the wind to your back, run. Run. Stop being afraid that the bottom's going to fall out. Some of you, you things are going so well, you are just looking around for the bottom to fall out. And God is saying, stop looking for the bottom to fall out and just run. He is looking across the earth for who he can use. And what I believe is that he's looking at this church and saying, can I use you in this time, in this moment? That being said, stand to your feet. We're going to go now into a time of worship. My challenge and my encouragement to us is this, is to not worry about what we have to do when we leave here, but take the next few minutes to set our affection and attention upon Jesus. Jesus.